Howdy folks, Shell Presto here. Today we're going to talk about how to do a comic book cover homage. Now, there's two types of homages. The one where you essentially just retrace the characters but change their hair and clothing to look like different characters, which we're not going to go over. Or the type where you draw in your own style, trying to capture the layout and feel and a bit of the style of the original cover, which is what I'll be doing today. Before I get into my usual discourse, I'll point out what I'm doing here. I'm drawing a grid over the cover I want to homage, and drawing a corresponding grid on my paper. This will help me place the characters in a similar arrangement, which is vital for an homage. A lot of kids' drawing books put grids over the images, then tell you to draw the same image into a blank grid. And they do that for a very good reason. Grids help you judge distance more accurately and take better notice of details. I don't often use them because they can also feel limiting if you're trying to exaggerate a pose. But for an homage, well, we'll get into that in a bit. Now, when you're talking comic book covers, it's hard to pick a better artist to make a tribute to than Jack the King Kirby. Lots of artists put Kirby on a pedestal, and I can tell you it's not without good reason. It's not that his art is perfect. It doesn't have the finesse or flow of, say, Neil Adams. But Kirby's work is the true platonic ideal of the four-color comic book world. Uh, this is the man whose otherworldly characters and background designs and bombastic layouts came together to give us the unforgettable, iconic Captain America, Avengers, X-Men, and most importantly of all, the title that got the Marvel Age of Comics rolling and heralded the Silver Age, the Fantastic Four. It is Fantastic Four number 82 that I'll be paying homage to in this video using my and my husband's original characters from our Challenger Confidential series. Our writing is deeply inspired by that 60s Stan Lee Jack Kirby style, so it felt more than right to pick from the Fantastic Four catalog. It's not the most memorable cover, but I needed something that could show off a lot of heroes without giving a lot of retail space to a villain and also didn't show the heroes in peril. And while I'm making some definite compositional changes and drawing the characters in my style, I think at the end of the day, people in the know will know exactly what I was going for and recognize the work as having a definitive Kirby flavor. So that's the first point in doing an homage cover, looking for the right source material. Whether you're using your own characters or doing fan art, you need poses on the cover that fit those characters. Think of the original cover as having character slots. You need one of your figures to fit each slot. For example, this cover wouldn't work if I didn't have characters who could fly or super leap or float. The whole top of the page would be empty. Likewise, homaging, say, the first Fantastic Four cover wouldn't have worked, even though that's arguably the most iconic Fantastic Four cover. Like I said, I wanted something that gave more retail space to the heroes, not a villain or monster. And in that first iconic cover, the Mole Man's behemoth of a beast coming up from the underground takes up most of the page, and the Fantastic Four are teeny tiny figures fighting it. Taking another example, X-Men number one has the Beast swinging in on a trapeze. This works great for Beast, but may be silly for other characters. So if you wanted to emulate that cover, you'd either need to change the pose or have a very gymnastic character who that pose would make sense for. After you've picked your cover, you need to lay out the cover you're creating in a way that, when you're finished, still resembles that cover. That's where the grid comes in. The grid will help you to keep characters in the right position, even if you end up making changes. I tweak or write out change poses in this piece, 
but the characters' heads are all in the same position as in the original cover, and the flow of their movements and bodies still match the flow and movement of the original. And I'm able to double check that and make sure of that because of the grid. Now, depending on who originally drew the cover, you may need to alter the poses to fit your style, even if the poses are ones your characters would make. Jack Kirby worked in a very animation-y style, in no small part because he worked in animation. Therefore, he often used exaggerated foreshortening and perspective, which makes his pieces really dynamic, but can be difficult to translate into other styles. For example, you may be familiar with, say, showing a punching character's hand as huge in front of them, implying that it's closer to the camera. The thing in the original Fantastic Four 82, or Bulwark as I'm drawing here, are doing that exact technique, where his fist is just as big as his head. That's a perspective trick. No one's fist is really as big as their head, but when someone's arm is extended really close to us, when they are already standing close to us, it appears that way. And it's super dynamic. This technique is most believable when things are close to us. But take Crystal's foot in this original cover. She's already pretty far away from the viewer, but there's still some really sharp foreshortening going on, making her foot appear really far back. So I adjusted my drawing to get rid of that sharp perspective trick. But that brought on a host of other issues. A big part of it was that I didn't identify the horizon line before I dove in. You won't see me run into that problem until part two of this. This drawing rightly took me forever and a day. There are eight characters in it, and it's on an 11 by 14 piece of paper. So I'm breaking this down into three parts two for drawing, one for coloring. I do hope you'll subscribe to stick around and see the whole thing through to the end. Anyway, part two will dive into perspective among character figures. And you thought perspective was just for rooms and furniture. As far as the figures go, I did have to make some changes. No one in the Challenger Foundation can stretch like Mr. Fantastic, so I had to make sure I could fill in the space that was left above the Promethean's pointing arm, which was originally Mr. Gi Mr. Fantastic's giant hand. Hydro-Man's water trail worked nicely and preserves the flow of the original piece. I suppose I should come clean and say that part of the reason I'm even doing an homage is that I'm often scared of doing big group shots. I shouldn't be. I've been drawing or practicing drawing comic book art for 25 years, so you'd think I'd have picked up a thing or two. But giant group shots are daunting, and a great way to learn is to look at the greats. I'm also trying to find a way to strike a chord with the target audience of our books. I've mentioned in passing in other videos that it's really hard to get people interested in your original characters in lieu of fan art. Part of that is because new things don't resonate with your memories. People justifiably have things they already like, and they already know they would like more of that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And as a matter of fact, I'm the same way. Show me some classic uh, John Byrne, Chris Claremont era X-Men, 90s anime, or Final Fantasy 3, now 6 fan art, and I'm looking. No shame in that. But an homage can actually help your work resonate with fans without actually using the characters of the fandom. In our Challenger Confidential series, we really try to go for a classic Stan Lee, Jack Kirby era Fantastic Four feel. So I'm hoping that by putting the characters in a lineup that feels like a Jack Kirby cover, that will speak to people at cons and online and convey that vibe. We're also hoping to capture some of the drama, weirdness, and mystery of classic sci-fi and horror shows like the Hammer Horror films and TV show. But that's an homage for a different day. So, 
if you've got original characters or a book or comic that you're trying to get people interested in, perchance you could try some homage art that captures both the feel of your own characters and something that taps into the nostalgic and established. And of course, even if you just do fan art, there's a lot to be said for mashups and humoristic homages. Lord knows, half the internet saw that Kylo Ren, Calvin, and Hobbes mashup. And let's be honest, it was pretty good. As far as drawing giant group shots go, I guess the best advice I can give is to take your time on each character. You want to draw each character individually and well, and just thinking about the process as eight drawings of a single character, albeit on the same page, instead of one drawing with eight characters crammed in there, makes it a lot less scary. Start with the characters closest to the viewer, the ones in the foreground, and work back. You can see I'm even inking characters as I finish them. I'm not waiting until the end and inking all eight at once. This will help me remember who is in the front and what will be in the final piece. I wouldn't want to ink Meteora, the girl who is flying, first, and then find out that I inked her leg in front of Bulwark instead of putting his fist out in front where it belongs. Just as important, focus on one character at a time. Pencil the entire figure, even if they'll be behind someone else. It may be tempting to say, well, Meteora's leg is behind Bulwark's fist, so I don't have to draw it. But the viewer will be able to tell that something's missing if, say, the angle at Meteora's hip indicates her leg would be extended and show past Bulwark's fist, and the viewer will notice it and it will look wrong to them. So go ahead. Render each character in full, even if it's just roughly, and don't cut corners. Work out the poses in full. Now the hardest parts. One, you have to make sure the characters are in perspective with one another, even if there aren't any buildings or roads or anything structural in perspective behind them. But like I said, I'll cover all that in part two, because that's kind of its own topic, but we'll go through it and we'll try to make sure everyone understands it. But related to that, make sure that characters who are about the same distance from the viewer match up proportionately. For example, if you have two, ma two female or two male characters about the same distance away, make sure their heads are about the same size. Make sure their hands and feet are about the same size. If you have one male and one female character, make sure you're drawing the male character slightly bigger. Unless, of course, your female is She-Hulk, or your male is Puck, or Ant-Man. Who watching knows who Puck is? Not Shakespearean Puck, although it's cool if you know him too, but Marvel's Puck. If you do, let me know in the comments so I can tell you that you're awesome. Then go have a cookie. You deserve one, eh? Anyway. Also pay close attention to and work out where characters who are very close to each other may overlap. Still, the most important thing is, deep breath, one character at a time. You can do this. And if you get hung up on part of one character, that's okay. Just work on another character and come back to them. Ten small drawings of one character, not one giant drawing with ten characters. You can do it. I believe in you. Before I close my yap and let you listen to some cool music, I should mention that all of these characters are part of our Challenger Confidential book series. My husband and I write prose books, that's book books, not comic books, with illustrations by yours truly. Our novella Copper Knights and Granite Men features these characters. And if you'd like to get to know them, you can check out our books either in ebook or print format through Amazon or other booksellers. I'll leave links in the description. I'd be super grateful if you did because it helps this channel since being a self-published illustrator and writer doesn't exactly pay the bills. But I can hope, right? Anyway, I'll catch you closer to the end of the video. Enjoy some tunes.
pretentious, super-powered musician, an ageless techno wizard, and a radioactive commando walk into a museum. Copper Knights and Granite Men is a witty and suspenseful superhero adventure that draws from the King in Yellow mythos and taps the secret occult history of North America. As one of our readers describes it, this book has the detail of a Sherlock Holmes mystery combined with the fun and excitement of reading a superhero comic book. Okay, there was my plug. I hope my drawing helps you guys have confidence with your own group shots and homages. If you liked my video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know in the comments below. I'd especially like to know if you want me to go over anything mentioned in this video in further detail, or any future topics you'd like covered, or who your favorite comic book cover artist is. I'm pretty partial to John Byrne and Chris Bacchello, and Alex Ross, but everyone loves him, right? Most importantly of all, though, have an awesome day. Wow, uh, Ben Grimm is actually a terrible example of this because, uh, yeah, his, his fist is totally the size of his head, if, if not bigger. Bad, bad job there, Ben. You're setting a bad, bad example for artists everywhere. But you're still really, really cool to draw. Go. Okay, so in the example I was giving before, uh, this is with my arm extended, and right now I'm pretty far away from the camera, so you can see that my uh, hand looks a normal size compared to my face and the rest of my body. And that's because I'm far away from the cameraman and the camera. But if the cameraman and the camera were to be closer to me, then the perspective would get more extreme, and my fist would look way bigger than my head and my body. So, in the uh, portrait that I'm drawing that Jack Kirby did, it's just a little off to have the very extreme perspective when someone's standing away from you.